buy a meal, we will provide a meal for an impoverished family. You know, so it's this buy one, give one. BOGO is often what it's called. Buy one, give one. But there's also this huge just give back. So there's this mentality now. And a lot of consumers have gotten to the point where they want to give back. If they're going to buy something, they want it to give back. And they'll say, okay, are you giving back? How are you giving back? Welcome to the Brand Stars podcast. If you're a visionary woman with a message to share, and you're already the face of your brand, but would love to become the star of your brand, then you're in the right place. I'm Naomi Espent, longtime personal branding photographer, videographer, trainer, and creator of the online Brand Stars Academy. I host inspiring guests on this podcast, each an expert in their own field. And we all share a passion for helping our fellow women to shine our light and share our brilliance in the world even more brightly. So that's the golden thread goal of each episode. Let's dive in. Enjoy. Very special welcome to my beautiful guest, Dawn Mansky. Welcome, Dawn. Thank you so much, Naomi. I'm thrilled to be here. I'm so excited to have you with us. And really, it's an honor. Thank you. Um, I know there's some very fascinating insight and inspiration that you're going to be sharing with all of us. So just a quick introduction about this beautiful lady, Dawn Mansky. She is empowering women around the world through dignified employment in the fight against human trafficking. Her 10 years of living in China and visiting orphanages full of little girls taught her about the horrors of trafficking. I'm going goosey already, Dawn. After getting to know children and teens who had been victims of this, her dream to help rescue and restore trafficked people started with a pair of pants. And Dawn said, if there's any way I can help girls like this by selling pants, I will sell pants. So she's going to share more about that story with you. And that led Dawn to founding Made for Freedom, love this name too, a social enterprise offering fashion and lifestyle products, which are gorgeous ladies, I've had a look, and they are created by survivors of human trafficking. And in the process, Dawn increased her understanding of using solid, ethical business practices to create systemic social change. And don't we need that? She has been involved in business strategy, product development, and social value measurements in order to help other people. And she's committed to doing everything in her power to help women around the world know that we are all made for freedom. Absolutely love this, Dawn. Please, may I? Yeah, it's so special and really touches the heart. So may I hand over to you and just ask you to share a bit about your journey and what has brought you to do these deeply meaningful and inspiring things that you do today. It is interesting because Made for Freedom, it kind of started with these crazy pants and it, was, it wasn't just the pants. So it was kind of leading up to that was learning about human trafficking. So like you said, I lived in China for 10 years and during the first couple of years, I used to go and visit orphanages and I realized these orphanages were full of little girls. And now that I have dug into exploitation and the things that make people vulnerable, devaluation of the girl child is a significant vulnerability around our world. And the not valuing girls was very evident in these orphanages. And then a few years later, living in China, I met this incredible woman and she moved to Beijing specifically to start a school for street children. And I had seen these kids and they were begging on the street corners and at night they would go and wash cars and sell flowers. And I didn't really understand what the situation was. And she's the one who helped me understand what that was. And it's, it's what we would call trafficking, labor trafficking. Um, that wasn't the terminology that we used then, but these children would from small impoverished neighborhoods and villages around China would be lured to the city by what we called bosses, what we could also call procurers or perpetrators. But these men typically, not always, but these men would go back to the small villages in rural China and look for those who were incredibly vulnerable, those who were having a hard time feeding their children for the families that were struggling, or if a parent died, if they lost a job, if there was, you know, the more you stack up these vulnerabilities, one of which is 
extreme poverty, they would identify those who were incredibly vulnerable and approach them. And probably the community knew them, but they would approach the family and say, hey, if you let me take your son or daughter to the big city, they'll have a better life, they'll get a great job, there are all these amazing opportunities in the big city, and the families would agree. And the kids would be brought to Beijing by the boss, and the bosses would have 15, maybe 20 kids in a little apartment, and that's where they lived, that's where they were often, I would say, abused, um, physically, emotionally, uh, you know, they're not attending school, and their job was going out in the afternoons and begging, washing cars, selling flowers, doing whatever, and all the money would come back to the boss. So that's how the bosses were making money. It was off of these children. So this lady that I met came to Beijing specifically to get to know these kids. And she would, before they were required to be working, or so we would call it, um, she would hold birthday parties and she would take them to the zoo and she got to know them by name. And, you know, these kids that were begging and oftentimes foreigners were avoiding them because they didn't know what to do. She was engaging with them and getting to know them. And so I got to know these kids and celebrated with them, celebrated holidays, um, but really started to understand this labor trafficking and this exploitation of children through those relationships and through what she was doing. So I, this was just kind of some of the thing, these were some of the things that I saw while living there. When I returned to the United States, I was in grad school, I was attending seminary and there was an informational lunch hosted by IJM, International Justice Mission, and it was a video of an undercover reporter going into the back streets of Cambodia. And he was asking for the youngest girls he could find. And this video shows him go into this little room back in the alleys of Cambodia. And these guys bring in, they usher in maybe eight, I don't know, five to eight, nine girls. And these girls looked like they ranged from maybe seven to 13. And they, the guys were just offering the girls and they're like, okay, which one would you like? And it just, it broke my heart. And I saw these little girls and I thought, how is it that we live in a world that little girls are growing up like this? One, two, that there are people who want this. And three, that there are people forcing children to grow up like this. And it just weighed on me. And I realized that that, I, I think that was kind of when I realized this is way bigger than the kids that I met on the street corners in Beijing. This is a, this is a huge issue. This is labor trafficking. This is sex trafficking. This is exploitation at all different levels of those who are incredibly poor, those who are vulnerable. So I had this thing just weighing on me. And I desperately, desperately wanted some way that I could get involved in fighting this. And it, you know, I tried, we, I did some things on our campus at grad school. We had a, we hosted a concert and we raised money for a safe house and, you know, but I still wasn't quite feeling, okay, this is how I can get involved. And then fast forward a couple of years and I met this incredibly handsome young man and I married him. So that, <laughs> and so, and it seems like a strange connection, but that our wedding was two more pieces of this. And so I have this issue that's weighing on me and I have these two wedding gifts. So one of them was a wedding gift from my husband and it was a pair of sandals I had seen that really gave this incredible story of social enterprise. And, and so I, I learned how business can be used to help people. And I got another gift from a friend who came from Thailand for the wedding and she brought fisherman pants because I had a pair of fisherman pants and I could not find any in the United States. And I, that's what she brought as a wedding gift. 
So of course, what, what am I wearing the day I go leave for my honeymoon? What would you be wearing? So I'd be wearing the sandals and the fisherman pants for sure. Right. So I'm wearing my new pants. I'm wearing my new sandals. And we go to the airport to leave for our honeymoon. And a TSA agent comments on my pants. And I'm like, okay, I got them in Thailand. Thanks for the compliment. And then a flight attend the flight attendant says, oh my gosh, those are so cool. Where did you get them? I got them in Thailand. And over the next several months, every time it seemed like every time I left the house wearing these pants, people were commenting on them. So I went to the hospital to visit a friend and a stranger walked up. Oh, I love your pants. Where did you get them? And then I'm in a parking lot going some, I don't know where I was going. A woman literally was chasing me. She's like, those pants are so cool. Where did you get them? And I'm like, this is crazy. And that was when I kind of started thinking, huh, I love these pants. I can't find them in the United States. Maybe I'll import pants. And every, everything in me was like, I don't want to start a business importing pants. Like, I don't want to sell pants. But that it kind of, they came together. And it was like, people really like these crazy pants. What if these pants could be the foundation of a business that could help people, a social enterprise, could help people specifically coming out of this horrible thing that I have been struggling to figure out how I can be part of it. So all of those came together and I said, okay, if that works, I'll sell pants. <laughs> Fantastic. I love your story, Dawn. And I love how organically it all happened. Um, obviously, I don't love all parts of it because, my gosh, it hits straight to the heart what you're saying um, with mm. regard to the little girls and just how, yeah, the the abuse and the, um, just the whole horror of the of the human trafficking scenario. Um, right. And I also, just on that point, I, I read, I think a statistic, was it on your website of around 40 million people involved in, mm. in that? Modern day slavery, yeah. So we don't really know how many people are modern day slaves. When you mm. talk about human trafficking, it's the same thing as modern day slavery. Um, it's you, force, fraud, coercion is causing these people to be in this situation. And mm. the numbers were about 27 million for quite a while, maybe 29, 30 something like that. But um, the, the numbers recently jumped pretty significantly. And I saw these numbers coming out from the mm -hmm. Justice Department. Well, they started including forced marriage. And that, oh, that oh. hadn't been included before. But if you think mm -hmm. about these young, if you think about the vulnerabilities that I'm talking about mm -hmm. that lead to exploitation, young, impoverished, devaluation of the girl child, these young ladies are being sold for marriage. And they really, I would say rarely, is it a marriage that is healthy, that is good? Mm -hmm. Often they're used more as servants than as a wife. So, yeah. so anyway, that's a the little bit of history. Those numbers have jumped recently because now forced marriage is part of that um, modern day slavery category. Mm -hmm. Sure, Dawn. So I just want to also give a quick shout out to Alison who joined us and she says, I definitely have to watch the replay of this. Thank you, ladies. Oh. Alison's amazing. She's also in the USA. She's um she's a fitness coach. And she oh, okay. actually, yeah, she had a she had a gym in a, a bricks and mortar gym with her husband in New York, um, which they lost unfortunately due to COVID. So she's teaching online. But she mm. also does a lot for social impact. So I know she will be fascinated by what she's saying. And Dawn, I just, so I love this other part of your story where you're talking about the pants and the sandals, so <laughs> special from your wedding. And I can just picture this because I've also seen your pants on your website and mm -hmm. I love them as well. So I, I'm in Johannesburg now, but I come from Cape Town and there's quite a strong, um, what should I call it? Like a beach, like a beach babe, hippie culture <laughs> almost in Cape Town. And those pants, I think, would go down a treat with a lot of people. <laughs> nice. Okay. So but can I tell you a story about yes. the pants? Yes. I love, I love how we got started. I love sharing the story. 
our first partner. So we started reaching out to see, okay, can we make this happen? And who, who can make these pants for us? Who, who can we find that is, you know, I'm, I'm shooting out this random email to friends of mine. I lived in China for 10 years. So I have people, inter, Beijing is a very international city. So I have friends that have kind of scattered all over the world. And I'm thinking, hmm, Thailand has a serious problem with trafficking. So I'll reach out to my friends in Thailand. And I send this random email and I'm like, hey, do you happen to know of anybody working with survivors of sex trafficking and teaching them how to sew? You know, I think maybe one of the most random emails I've ever sent, but I got a response. And one of my friends said, you have to contact this woman because she's working with this minority tribal group from the mountains, very vulnerable to exploitation, and they are sewing. So I reach out to this woman and we start this partnership. They were amazing. I didn't, I had no idea what I was doing. I sent them literally, I sent them a sketch of the pants. We redesigned the pants. So we, we didn't call them fisherman pants anymore. The, the original fisherman pants are very baggy in the back. And that's not the most attractive look, shall we say? And I thought if I'm gonna try and sell this in the Western culture, we need to trim this up a little bit so it doesn't quite look like a diaper from the back. And um, if we're gonna change the pattern, we probably should change the name because they're not gonna be fisherman pants anymore. So we call them Crea belly pants. And it took a long time to figure out what do we call them? Like this is our design kind of from this concept. And so we call them Crea belly, which is taken from creating a beautiful life. Because I wanted it to really represent what we're doing. And I reached out to this woman and with my expertise of one semester of home ec in high school, <laughs> I, I sketched these pants and I'm like, here's what we want to do. And they took it and they ran with it and they did several orders for us. Well, months later, years later, I don't know, later, I get an email from the, the founder and she said, our ladies are getting the most wonderful opportunities to further their education and start careers. And I was like, that, that is wonderful. That's what we want to see. We want to see more opportunities. And then she continued in the email and said, and we're no longer sewing. Oh. <laughs> I don't know. I was like, oh, okay. And so all of that said, we don't have any pants right now. We sold, oh. right, we, but <laughs> we, I can't, you know, I'm like, it's a great thing and it yeah. really kind of stinks for us, but <laughs> it's part of the impact we want to be a part of, you know, yeah. they were, they got to a new level and they were accomplishing new things and had new opportunities. And I thought, fabulous. Okay. Mm -hmm. We will find someone else to make the pants. So mm -hmm. I was in India in 2019, you know, before lockdown. <laughs> and connected with a new group working with survivors, amazing seamstresses, and mm -hmm. pants will be coming back. That's all. Mm -hmm. But if you go to the website and you're desperately looking for pants, I apologize. And I really am doing what I can. Um, but we don't have any Crea Belly pants right now. Okay, Dawn. So um, this is this is fascinating. I've just for everybody watching, I've just dropped the website details below um, on a ticker. Um, and so with the pants, yes, because I can imagine, you know, particularly in airports, because when you're traveling, so for those of you watching, if you haven't seen these pants, they look so comfy because you can really just tie them at your waist to whatever size your, your sort of tummy is feeling at the time, which is fantastic for traveling. Um, and especially, yes. so, so now heading into menopause well i'm way into menopause i feel this in my middle i'm like okay these are the right pants <laughs> and they're so comfortable yeah so it's fantastic that those ladies that have been making them are progressing like you said that's exactly the vision that's playing out um so brilliant to you and your whole team for for, for that and everything else you're achieving um, but also i will say looking at your website all the other products are beautiful dawn like really lovely lifestyle products. So let's chat about those just a little later. But if we can also just dive in a bit more, um, 
because there's so much wealth of experience that you've got here in terms of what you've managed to do by following your heart and following this, the breadcrumbs, kind of the steps, like you say, reaching out randomly and then, you know, the universe provides and, and <laughs> the right people come together. I love this. So can you share just a little bit from your perspective with our audience? Because I know many of the ladies in my network are really soul-led and heart-led entrepreneurs and would love to make impact and more impact, I know, um, but it's not always that easy to, to manage that in a sustainable fashion. So mm -hmm. can you share a bit, uh, a few tips with our audience in terms of how to make that happen, um, as kind of in a sustainable way, if you can? You know, um, that's a good question. And I love to answer it. I will warn you, I get a little bit on a soapbox right here. <laughs> okay. Okay. You're welcome. <laughs> That I am incredibly passionate about this. Made for Freedom is our business model is unique in that we very specifically only source from centers that are working with those who are incredibly vulnerable to exploitation or those who have survived human trafficking, usually sex trafficking. Um, and I get it. That's not, it's, it's not a typical model. It's not a normal model. And for people who are already doing business, it's not even realistic. Okay. The whole reason Made for Freedom exists is because we wanted to be involved in the fight against this atrocity. As far as other businesses, everything that I have learned and everything that I have come to understand, supply chains are so important. Supply chains... Mm -hmm. We, you know, we've gotten into a mentality as consumers and, and I would give a lot of credit to some of the early social enterprises. Um, Tom's, for example, I, th I think Tom's is probably one of the business models that helped change our culture, our consumer culture, as far as I can spend money on this item and I get something, but it also helps somebody else. And maybe that was, maybe it was prevalent, more prevalent than I realized before that. But that was a huge, very fast growth and a huge impact in consumerism. Just for those who might not know, being in South Africa, so Tom's, is that the shoe brand? Yes. Yeah, yes. So I've heard of it, but it's in the US. So I just, can you just give a little insight about it just for the ladies here who might not well, know? It's kind of, and I'm sure you've seen this business model. It's now become a very popular give back model. So it is, if you buy this, we will give this. So mm -hmm. it might be, if you buy this soccer, and I've seen examples of all of these. If you buy this soccer ball from this company, we will give a soccer ball to an impoverished community so that these kids can play soccer. If you buy this product, we will give a percentage of the money to this cause. It's all about you buy this and we will give this. So it's buy one and it's, it's not always one for one like the shoes. So Tom's was you buy a pair of shoes, we will give a pair of shoes to a child in an impoverished community. And it was a very, um, Blake Mykoski was the founder of Tom's. And he was incredibly passionate about providing shoes for children who didn't have shoes coming out of very poor communities. And that's, that's where this, that's where his model came from, but it has really spurred on all sorts of buy one, give one, buy a toothbrush. We'll give a toothbrush to a kid in need Buy a meal. We will provide a meal for an impoverished family. You know, so it's this buy one, give one BOGO is often what it's called. Buy one, give one. But there's also this huge just give back. So there's this mentality now, and a lot of consumers have gotten to the point where they want to give back. If they're going to buy something, they want it to give back. And they'll say, okay, are you giving back? How are you giving back? And I'm just going to tell you, okay, so a friend of mine, her daughter died of breast cancer. She was a friend of mine. Her mother's a friend of mine. It was horrible. Like she was young. She was in her thirties. It was, it was tragic as anyone in that situation. Like it's just tragic. Nobody wants that to happen to anyone. So this woman, I was working with her 
she brought in a magazine and it had all these things. And on the front of the magazine, it just, it was like huge, bold. Every purchase helps with research to fight breast cancer. And I, I looked at this, I completely understood why the woman brought it into the office. I don't want people to die from breast cancer. This was a friend of mine. She lost her daughter to breast cancer. Of course, I want to see research happening so that it can end breast cancer. There is no question about that. So I'm looking through the magazine and I see a scarf. Everything's kind of pink and I love pink and I really like scarves. And I thought, hey, there's a pink scarf. It's pink. It's, it's a scarf and it's helping. Like the money from this is going to help with research to fight breast cancer. And it was far more than I would normally spend on a scarf. But I thought, no, it's okay because I like scarves, I like pink, but the bigger thing here is this is going to work with research to fight breast cancer. It was one of those things you ordered. So I ordered a scarf and in the week or two that it took to get the scarf, I was reading through the magazine a little bit more. I would flip through on my lunch break or whatever. And in the fine print, I noticed it said 0.05% of the sale would go to research. And I was so hacked off. Point zero five. Are you kidding me? Like you're charging far more for this scarf than other scarves I purchase. And you're giving this minuscule amount. And, but on the front, that's all I talked about. We're going to fight breast cancer. We're fighting breast cancer. And I'm like, point zero five isn't doing much of anything. And so, but at that time, I also was learning more about the fashion industry and it was around 2013, I think, 2012, 2013, there was a collapse of, and this happens on, unfortunately on a somewhat regular basis, but in Bangladesh, there was a, a sweatshop, a factory, a garment factory that collapsed and over a thousand people died. And mm -hmm. it was in the Dhaka province uh, and the the building was called rana plaza mm -hmm. and this so i was becoming much more aware of these sweatshops and how things are being produced for the united states paying a poverty wage mm -hmm. horror, deplorable work conditions and people literally were dying and i'm thinking about this scarf and i'm like you didn't tell me who made the scarf you didn't, so did you get, and I don't know where the scarf was made, but did you go to Bangladesh, pay a poverty wage, pay cents on the dollar to get this made, charge mm -hmm. me a ridiculous amount of money, not ridiculous, but a good amount of money, more mm -hmm. than needed, mm -hmm. and then give away like a little bitty pittance? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm like, don't talk about the good that you're doing if you mm -hmm. are getting the items made at poverty wages, which leads to generational poverty, because you are part of the problem, because poverty is a major part of the vulnerabilities that lead to exploitation. So don't talk to me about your 0.05% that you're giving back and you're sourcing from someplace that doesn't play, pay living wage, doesn't have dignified employment. So all of that said, if there are people that are in business and they want to they want to make an impact in the world. Look at your supply chain. If you're selling mm -hmm. a consumer good, if you're look, if you're selling any item, look at your supply chain. Mm -hmm. Are you sourcing from places that are paying a living wage? Are you sourcing from places that are providing dignified employment? Because that empowers people rather than exploiting them. Yeah, that's brilliant, Dawn. Such powerful stuff that you're sharing here. And I just have another little shout out for Talana, who's with us. Talana, hi, thanks for joining us. And um, so I just missed her comment a few minutes ago. She was saying, hi, what is Dawn's website? I'd like to see these pants that you're talking so much about. Talana, you will love them. It will totally go with your vibe and your style. Um, and then Talana carries on. She says, oh, you read my mind, Naomi, because I put up the ticker with your website address. <laughs> yes. Um, and unfortunately, so they're not available. But they're not available. You, okay, but they will be. But Talana, I know. Um, yeah, Talana, this is close to your heart, I know, because I've seen Talana sharing also here in South Africa some 
fabulous mm. products made um, from, there's a lot of recycling that goes on and also, you know, to give people employment. So this is such a, it's such a fantastic topic. Um, Dawn, I love it. And I love what you're doing. So um, with, with that also in mind, do you have any stories to share? Um, probably some extremely heart-wrenching, but with regard mm. to people who you've helped and the way you've seen them, you know, come out of such dire circumstances through the things that the opportunities that you've provided for them um, along the way. Do you have any stories to share with us? Oh, you know, a lot of stories. No, I'm <laughs> um, sure. One that one was was really more during a research trip as I was looking for partners, as I was learning about sex trafficking and what that looks like and the pieces that are required to get people out of that and help them to return and reintegrate. Uh, we visited a safe house and it was, um, it was, a, it was in India and it was national day. And I was with a group of about 15 ladies and we went to visit this safe house and these girls had come out of red light districts near there. The girls were from, there, about a third were from that area in India, which is the poorest region in India. About a third of them came from Nepal and another third came from Bangladesh. And these are all countries where extreme poverty is very prominent or very, it's easy to see the extreme, like the poverty is extreme um, in many pockets of these countries but also devaluation of the girl child. And these young ladies were at a safe house. They had all been taken into trafficking. They had been forced or coerced and had lived in brothels and had lived in these red light districts for whatever amount of time. And they're still pretty much all teenagers. So these are young ladies that have been taken from their families, forced into this horrible thing, and then rescued. And now they're in a safe house. We went in not to provide counseling, not to provide any of the services that they desperately need. We were not trained for that. We came in to bring some joy and to help them celebrate National Day. So we brought beads and we were making bracelets and we were singing. I was, I was able to teach them such amazing English language through the song, head, shoulders, knees, and toes, knees, and toes, knees, and toes. So we're all laughing and having a good time. But while I'm up in front of the ladies and I'm singing the song and everybody, you know, and then you get faster and faster and everybody's laughing. I noticed this one young lady in the back corner who she looked like she just, she looked like she wanted to dissolve into the wall. Like she didn't want to have anything to do with the songs or the jewelry or other people like she just was kind of hovering in the corner and we all noticed it and so we were talking to the staff about okay what what's going on like obviously this young lady is dealing with something and she was maybe 15 or 16 and like a, like the other girls had been taken from her family thrown into a brothel been a sex slave for however long and it had been rescued. Well, the people from the center were able to connect with her family. Mm -hmm. And they said, we've got your daughter. Mm -hmm. Well, that day she found out her family didn't want her back because mm -hmm. she had been soiled. And so here is this, here's this 15 year old girl with little or no mm -hmm. education. And she has found out her family doesn't want her. And I, I'm not oh, even yeah. sure if she was from that country, she was not from that city for sure. Mm -hmm. But because of the poverty and because that was pulling from these three countries, she may have been in a completely different country. Mm -hmm. And so learning that and this particular center worked closely with centers that like the ones we partner with mm -hmm. so that these girls get skills so that these girls are educated to the level that they need to be you know some mm -hmm. women there's another center that we work with and they work with ladies coming out of a red light district that has over eleven thousand women in it 
And these ladies come in and many of them have been in this so long. The devaluation of the girl child is so extreme mm -hmm. and the poverty, mm -hmm. I know I keep hitting on those, but these are huge mm -hmm. in vulnerabilities. And these ladies come in, they could be women that are coming in. They're like, okay, I've lived this long in this life and I, I can leave. Um, they don't even know how to write their name. And this center teaches them how to write their name so that they can receive mm -hmm. a paycheck. And they've mm -hmm. never, they've never even needed to do that because they've been exploited for years. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, one lady, a totally different center again, came in mm -hmm. and she was so traumatized because mm -hmm. of what she had been through. She, she didn't want to join the other ladies. She didn't mm -hmm. want to, she didn't want to be around anybody and she mm -hmm. wanted to be there, but she was, she was so traumatized. She couldn't sit around the table with the other ladies and make the jewelry. She couldn't sit and do the packaging, mm -hmm. which, you know, if you think about the partners that we have, working with your hands is so therapeutic, you know, mm -hmm. that sitting and working with your hands with other people who have been through what you've been through mm -hmm. is an incredibly powerful experience. But she mm -hmm. wasn't ready for that at all. And mm -hmm. so the founder, talked to her and tried to figure out, okay, how can we get her involved? She wants to be here, but she's not ready <laughs> to no. engage in conversation. She's not ready. Mm -hmm. But the, the girl said, I love to write. Mm -hmm. And she had learned English growing up. And the wow. founder said, you know what? We need thank you notes written to all of our partners. And oh. the girl was like, I'll do that. And she yeah. just up and for the next couple months she sat in a room by herself which is what she needed and what she wanted and mm. she wrote thank you notes wow. and you know she was so happy to be part of helping she and but they put her in a space that she could handle mm. and you know and I've talked to I've talked to another place that makes it makes our t-shirts and they um the guy said, we will bring ladies in and we've, we put all of them through a certain training, like a three week training so that they can sew. Cause this is what we do. We sew t-shirts, we sell the t-shirts and we provide jobs like that's, and then our t-shirts are amazing. I'm just going to say organic cotton. They're the softest, like buttery cotton I've ever felt, but this particular center makes them. And this lady had, she, she came in went through the three week training and he said she could not sew a straight line to save her life. So <laughs> we put her in another week of training and she still was like, she could not do it. And they said, you know what? We need tags attached to the t-shirts and we need these t-shirts put in bags. So the ladies, depending on the center and what they do, I, they need photography. So the ladies, some of the ladies learn photography. They learn <laughs> photo editing. They learn mm -hmm. accounting, they learn bookkeeping, they learn inventory, they mm -hmm. learn, you know, so it's wherever their skills mm -hmm. lie, they are able mm -hmm. to engage yeah. and take on leadership if that's where they are. Yeah. Oh, this is magic, Dawn. I love those <laughs> stories. Thank you. Yeah, it's just so exciting. The the message of hope and opportunity that can change um mm. for them and just but heartbreaking also what you're saying with regard to that specific girl and her family not wanting to take her back i mean the devastation mm -hmm. um it's actually brought something to mind for me dawn i don't know i'm sure you must be familiar with lynn twist and the soul of money the book that she wrote are you familiar with her I'm not Oh, Dawn, you know. definitely need to connect. Oh, my goodness. Lynn Twist is amazing. So she wrote a book called The Soul of Money. And the, she's got quite a number of, of videos on YouTube. Oh, you, you are like soul sisters. I'm, I'm writing it down. Well, for <laughs> sure. She's, she's um, American as well. Um, and I'm not sure how old Lynn is now, but I think, gosh, I'm not sure. But she's been in the fundraising space for many years, like 30 years, maybe longer and um but worked on world hunger that that was like a big thing and right. also she's one of the founders of the pachamama alliance to help save the amazon rainforest mm -hmm. and her book is phenomenal I, i've got it on, on amazon on, on kindle 
And one of the things she's done is she's worked really, really extensively, Dawn, all over the world, probably in some similar places to you, um, with very disenfranchised, especially groups of women where the girl child is devalued to the extent one of her stories in India, the mothers would actually kill their own girl mm. daughters at mm -hmm. birth. And, and, and Lynn was instrumental in helping this group of women to take their power back and actually manage to change that. Um, mm. And also she spoke in India of the begging where some of the parents would actually even do go so far as to gouge out the eye of their child so that they would be better at begging. I mean, just the most ph right. phenomenal things. Right. Um, so anyway, I would love, love, love to, I don't know Lynn personally, I've just read her book, but I just see <laughs> something so strong in terms of you connecting. Because she has worked at that grass, grass, grassroots level with the poorest of the poor, although she always says she mm. doesn't call them poor because they are so resource rich, which is really what you're saying here too. There's so much that they have to, to do and to offer and to share. Um, yeah. And then also she's worked with the wealthiest of the wealthy from a fundraising perspective. And she mm. speaks about the, um, the soul of money and, and how the, the joy level or the suffering level, there's not much difference. It's not, right. money doesn't make you happier. Right. But, but, but what that brought to mind as well, Dawn, is I know I, I saw in one of your fabulous media appearances, because you've really got some wonderful media, and I think that's fantastic because you deserve even more. <laughs> so I'm so grateful to you making the time to come here. Um, but I saw that you won an award. Um, was that a financial thing? Because that's also something that can be helpful mm -hmm. if, if one can successfully raise funds for your cause, you know, and to help you mm -hmm. get things going. Yeah. Because I think also for you initially, was it quite difficult to just get started, to be able to get the traction um, so that you could get going? Right, right. Yeah. I am not one of those people that dreamed of being a business person. I, I had seen so many, I had seen some really horrible examples of business that were using people and, you know, just selfish. And I didn't want to have anything to do with business for the most part. I have two degrees in education and one in theology. Notice the lack of business there. So the fact that this got dropped in my lap, uh, kind of like you said, they all aligned. God dropped this puppy in my lap and I was like, okay, I'm going to do this. So I have to tell you, um, I went to talk to a man that I know in the fashion industry, an incredible business person. And I said, okay, here's my idea. What should I do? Like, and I go, what do you think? D does this work? And he said, I think this will work. You know, and I, this man is brilliant and I truly respect him. And I said, okay, what do I need to do? And he said, okay, top three things, write your executive summary, trademark the name of that company because a friend of mine came up with made for freedom. And I'm like, that is perfect. And he goes, yeah, my friend, he even said, he goes, I checked. It's not trademarked. I can't believe it's not trademarked. And I said, you know, God set that aside. Just wait, let it wait for me. And, and now I'm ready. So, but that was number two. So write your executive summary. Number two, trademark. Number three, write your business plan. And I am going to be totally honest here. When I walked out of his office, I had no, I had like 10 pages of notes. This man gave me so much, but those were the top three. And I was like, okay. And I walked out of his office and I absolutely changed number one. Number one became Google, what is an executive summary? <laughs> I was like, oh, I don't God. even know what an executive summary is. And so I got a, I did. I had to go find out what is he talking about? I don't even know what he's talking about. And so the concept came in 2011. That's when I got married. I know it, it very closely links with when I get when I got married. Exactly six months later, after all of these crazy encounters with women complimenting my pants, I was like, I got it. And I had talked to this guy and I talked about numbers and I, you know, he gave me the top three, which became the top four. Um, and six months later, I registered the LLC. So that was still 2011. But like I said, I didn't know anything. I did not, I didn't have a business degree. I didn't have business experience. I was a teacher. I taught, anyway, 
I didn't have any business experience. So I spent a long time working with coaches. I spent a long time digging in to write a business plan. I tried to write a business plan and someone <laughs> read it and they go, this is like those sad dying puppy commercials. <laughs> it's like, this is not a business plan. You need a business plan. And I was so passionate about doing something. I mean, I have a very nonprofit heart, you know, and mm -hmm. that decision between do we go nonprofit or do we go for profit? You know, mm -hmm. there is the reason for Made for Freedom is making impact. The reason for Made for Freedom is helping. So there are a lot of people that are like, you should have been a nonprofit. You should be a nonprofit. If you talk to a nonprofit person, they'll say you should be a nonprofit. You talk to a for profit person, they say you should be a for profit. So that mm -hmm. didn't help. Um, but I was able to connect with some other people doing very similar business models. And they said, oh, do for profit. You really just are able to do so much more in certain ways. You know, there, there are benefits on both sides, but it took, so we landed in for profit and social enterprise is a, is a very appropriate term for a for profit or a nonprofit. Um, but it does focus on making a social impact. And so social enterprise is what I love talking about. And we, we got better at writing business plans. And yes, I was able to get some awards, um, some financial support and awards. And, you know, from groups that one group typically only gave to nonprofits, but they saw what we were doing and how we were approaching making impact using business strategies, which nonprofits can also use those strategies, but they were, they were impressed with how we were putting Made for Freedom together. And so where they typically would only give to nonprofits, they actually gave to a for-profit Made for Freedom. And then I was in another competition and they typically would only give to high growth, high you know, high expansion businesses. And then here I come along and I'm talking about human trafficking and I'm like, we're going to change the world. And they, they had to have some serious discussion, but they said, you know what? We believe in what she wants to do and we're going to, we're going to give her money as well. So it's been interesting, this, this kind of tight rope walk between it's not between nonprofit or for profit, but it's it's figuring out how these two work together. How do you mm. how do you build? How do you scale like a business with the impact of a nonprofit? So, absolutely, Dawn. It's I'm it's fascinating. And another Dawn has joined us. Dawn Gossard from the UK. Okay. Thank you, Dawn. Shout out to you. So Dawn has just wrapped up a wonderful online uh, summit called Financially Free Women, which she very kindly included an interview with me. Uh, we were talking photography and video and you know, getting your message out there. But um, so Dawn Grossart, I'm saying, you could probably weigh in on this as well, um, because it is, it's that age old uh, kind of question, especially for new business owners of, okay, should it be the for-profit, should it be the non-profit? I, I completely understand that question. Um, but I also love the social enterprise angle. I mean, to me, that is kind of marrying the best of both worlds. And mm -hmm. also because what you're standing for is essentially, in a sense, financial freedom and certainly financial empowerment for the yes. women who you are helping. So, I mean, lead by example, by all means, so that you can also, <laughs> you know, yourself and experience that. Um, yeah, so brilliant. Uh, it's uh, It's... Quite a learning curve. Um, my husband and I were involved in a nonprofit as well for a couple of years for conservation, wildlife mm -hmm. conservation. We were doing filming and photography, and it is it's it's also it's a difficult space to really succeed in, and it's quite fraught with a lot of emotions. We we sort of discovered. So um, yeah, I mean, I, I love your model, and I, I think it's brilliant. And um, I'm just looking at the time, Dawn. It has 
moon. <laughs> not, I'm not I, I told you I'm a storyteller. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm not going to cut you off because I think this is so valuable. Um, but I do want to just give you an opportunity to make sure we don't run out of time to just share a bit about how, what, how people can get involved and what they can do. Um, because I'm sure that many who get to watch this, whether now or later, will feel the call to do something to help. Um, and how they can get in touch with you and what opportunities you offer them to engage. Well, thank you. It's, that, is, that is one thing I have found is people hear about human trafficking, they hear about sex trafficking and how this is impacting our world and immediately is, what can I do? And I get it. That's exactly where I was. I was learning about it and I desperately wanted to figure out how can I join the fight against this horrible thing. So I would encourage people, one, just continue learning. Learn more about what does human trafficking look like? A lot of people think they're, they're kind of these two ends of the pendulum. And one is, oh, sex trafficking isn't happening around me or human trafficking, whether it's labor or sex trafficking, it's not happening around me. And then there's the other end and it's, oh, I've, I've started learning about this and somebody said that our city is number one in sex trafficking. Well, maybe not. Probably There's only one that's really number one and it's not something to be bragging about either way. But um, if you're on this side and you're thinking it's not happening around you, go online and look for your city. Just type in, do a search for your city and human trafficking or sex trafficking. And I pretty much guarantee you'll find some news report of, of some arrest or something that happened because they're, because it's happening. If you're over here on this side and you think my city's the worst, it's probably not, but is it happening? Yes. Any city that has an inter has interstates, multiple interstates going through it. Transportation is huge. That's how cities were established back in the day. Rivers, you have rivers, you have multiple rivers coming together. I'm from St. Louis. We have two rivers coming together. That's why St. Louis was founded because transportation is essential. Human trafficking is a business. And I, I am so jumping into education. Sorry. You <laughs> asked me, what can people do? Learn more, educate yourself. And we have, <laughs> sorry, I just, I can go. Good. One of the things, so I've put together a PDF that you can download. It's a free download at madeforfreedom.com slash, you can just do podcast dash download or pages download if you click on that. We'll have the link also, um, but that has a PDF and it I go through and it's, it's pretty simple, but it's a list of red flags. If you're, if you're in the store and you're next to somebody who is being trafficked, there are red flags that you, if you know them, then you can identify them and you can say something or you can do something. There are also risk factors. I've talked through several of them, but a more extensive list of what are the things that cause people to be vulnerable? What are the risk factors involved in human trafficking? And then some things that you can do to take action. Like I was talking about before, look at the things that you purchase. Look for things with ethical supply chains. Look for things that are made that are supporting dignified employment. And that is not always easy to do. I would recommend if you have, if you like quality items made specifically for professional women and you like jewelry or candles or little baby gifts, Made for Freedom is a great place to purchase gifts. Like I have explained, we partner with these centers that are providing dignified employment for them. And I have also encountered a lot of people that say, okay, I bought my necklace. I love my necklace. I bought my t-shirt. I bought my earrings. I bought my purse, but what else can I do? And for people who are just super excited and they're like, okay, I want to do more. I would not necessarily recommend starting a business like Made for Freedom because it is so extremely hard. But we have put together a program that is specifically for people like that. And if you go to the website made for freedom, you'll see at the top, it says go deep. And we have a video program that we can send you along with a package of product. And so you can pull together your own group of people 
and say, hey, let's not only learn about the issue, but let's be part of the solution. And DEEP, it's all caps, and because it's an acronym for Dignified Employment Empowers and Protects. So it works well with the acronym, but it also, it also prepares people because we go deep. This is not an easy topic. This is, this is like a home party. This is like a house party, but we're not just selling pretty things. We're talking about a horrible, horrible situation in our world. We're educating people and we're going deep. So if you're not prepared to go deep, that can be difficult. If, if somebody comes to your home and says, oh, I'm so excited, you know, thanks for inviting me. And then we start talking about sex trafficking, they might just be blown away. So I wanted to give it a name, like let's go deep because this is a horrible issue, but we also have a way that you can pretty easily be part of the solution. Oh, fantastic, Dawn. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing that. And I love your acronym, Deep Dignified Employment and Powers Protects. Fantastic. So needed in the world. And one of the things I just wanted to mention, I also love about your products. So ladies, do go and have a look at Made for Freedom at the products. It's yeah, coming up for Christmas time too. Um, mm. Because what I loved is the words um, on some of the products, on some of the pieces of jewelry, and even on the t-shirts. So do some of your ladies come up with those or how does that work? Is that an organic process? Both. So the t-shirts we typically design and we send those over. And those are, like I said, those are made and screen printed now. For a long time, they didn't do the screen printing, but they've taught the ladies to do the screen printing. So the t-shirts are made and screen printed by the ladies coming out of that huge red light district in India. Um, the necklace, one of the necklaces you might be talking about. Oh, so beautiful. I'm not wearing it. Sorry. Uh, you can't, you wouldn't be able to see it because it's a little longer. It's a 32 inch bar, but it has writing mm. on three sides and it says, seek justice, love mercy, walk humbly. And mm. we just need so much more of that in our world. Mm. And it's just, it's a beautiful stainless mm. steel piece that goes with anything. I have people that come mm. back and see me at conferences and things and they're like i wear this all the time it's so wow. easy and though, so oh and i ha i do i am wearing these but these are little dangle earrings that i love and they say love and justice mm -hmm. so we have some really powerful statement pieces but one of the things that we try to do is there are a lot of fair trade groups that are doing really good things and and providing mm -hmm. dignified employment we spe we specifically focus on one group of people to provide that employment for. So that's great. But I, when we started doing this, I very much wanted for Made for Freedom to be a good place for professional women because mm -hmm. we can't, uh, I love the colorful prints and all of the things that are very fair trade looking, mm -hmm. you know, and the, they're, they're just kind of a fair trade look and that, mm -hmm. There's a side of me that that is me, but I'm also a business owner and I had to start going to these business meetings and I had to start going to these networking things. And I'm like, hmm. And I realized this is kind of a space that is needed for professional women who desperately want to have an impact through their purchases, but they need to be able to wear it to a business meeting. So we really have tried to kind of curate items that would work well for professional women and make a powerful statement. And you have succeeded, Dawn. I was really impressed by your by all your products. And I really love the statement jewelry. Like you say, it's something that I would notice on another woman and go, oh, I'd like to have that. Um, can, I, can I tell you about one? Yes. It's, it's hearing the story is just probably more powerful than reading it. Um, if people take the time to read it. So we have, we have these black, heart black and gold and black and silver necklaces so there's the black and silver that has a star cut out of the middle and we have a black and gold mm -hmm. circle that has a heart cut out of the middle those middle pieces so these are made at a center in southern china by survivors coming out of red light districts near there oh and a couple different cities this group has several locations working with survivors but the middle piece that middle star and that middle heart is taken out it's cut out of those 
made into another necklace. Those necklaces are given to young ladies still working in red light districts. And as a gift, they are told, we don't want anything from you because these girls are accustomed to having to give something if they receive anything. And they say, we don't want anything from you. This is purely a gift, but we want you to know that you're valuable and someone wearing the other part of this is standing for your freedom. Oh, and it's just, it, I love wearing that piece as well. Actually, that oh, silver yeah. black star, the gift of starlight goes yeah. beautifully with the seek justice. It's a little, anyway, it's a lovely it's combo. It's beautiful. <laughs> uh, yes, and I noticed those. I noticed those specific ones on your website, the star and the heart. And that story mm -hmm. is so special. I didn't see the story on the website. So, yeah. oh my gosh, Dawn, I can see this going so much bigger. And is it, is it international? So like in South Africa, can we get delivery here if we order off your website? I will make sure that you can. I think oh, so. But uh -oh. as soon as we're finished, I will go on and I will double check for South Africa. We do, yeah. ha we do allow shipping for multiple places. Uh, sometimes the, the shipping cost it becomes prohibitive and, you know, people aren't willing to do that. But um the one yeah. thing as well in South Africa, unfortunately, we actually have a poor postal service. I've had cousins and a beautiful friend of mine, three different people who've actually sent me a Christmas gift this time last year, and it was returned to them like recently <laughs> by a <laughs> career or somewhere weird. So oh. yeah, that could stand in the way thinking about it. But um, who knows, maybe in future there could be it could work, which would be amazing. <laughs> um, right. Yeah. So Dawn, uh, we've, we've actually passed the hour and I'm so grateful to you for joining us and for all of this beautiful inspiration. I feel like we've just started the conversation. <laughs> so thank you for taking the time and uh, thank you everybody who's joined us. Do you have any Definitely. final little jewel to drop in for us? I hope that everyone has amazing holidays and as you're purchasing Think about how those purchases can help other people. And that, I mean, I think that it just serves so many purposes. It helps people. You're providing a nice gift and you know that you're part of a solution for something bigger than you. Yes, that's a beautiful way to end. Thank you, Dawn. And Talana says, thank you. Very inspiring. Thank you, Talana. And she is inspiring too. So mm. grateful to you, Dawn. Very inspiring. Thank you. And all Thank the best you so much you. for having me. I truly appreciate this. I love, I love having these conversations and, and I'm excited to, I'm excited to share the story. So thank you very much for having me. You're most welcome. Thank you, Dawn. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. We hope you enjoyed this episode as much as we enjoyed recording it for you. If you did, please share this podcast with your women friends leave us a review and subscribe. We'll be most grateful to get the message out to more visionary women who want to become the star of their brand. And here's to you becoming the star of your brand. To help you with that, hop over to brandstarscourse.com and grab your free online course to get started. Then join us for the next podcast episode. Thank you for being part of our Brand Stars community and have a radiant rest of your day.